Y'all stay with me. One day, as we were going down to the place of prayer, this is Paul and Silas, this is happening to them. One day as they were going down to the place of prayer, it says we met a demon-possessed slave girl. She was a fortune teller who earned a lot of money for her masters. And she followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the Most High God and they have come to tell you how to be saved. She's not for them. She's not preaching to them. She's mocking them. She's following them around day after day, annoyingly mocking them, trying to pressure them to get them to stop what they're doing. But this one on day after day until Paul got so exasperated that he turned around and he said to the demon within her, I'm going to preach today, y'all. Said to the demon within her, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. And instantly it left her. Her master's hope of wealth were now shattered. So they grabbed Paul and Silas and they dragged them before the authorities at the marketplace. So she, see, she's working for somebody and her fortune telling is making them money. And now that she's delivered and the demon's gone, and now that she's saved and has, has Jesus, now they're not going to make all that money off of her. So they're mad. They're pitching a fit. Now they take them and drag them in front of everybody. And it says this. This is what they say. They say the whole city is in an uproar because of these Jews. They're teaching customs that are illegal for us Romans to practice. And a mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas. And the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooden rods. They were severely beaten. And then they were thrown into prison. The jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape. So the jailer put them into the inner dungeon and clamped their feet in stocks and chains. And around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Listen to this. And the other prisoners were listening. And suddenly there was a massive earthquake. And the prison was shaken to its foundations. And all the doors immediately flew open. And the chains of every prisoner fell off. The jailer woke up to see prison doors wide open. He assumed the prisoners had escaped. So he drew his sword to kill himself. But Paul shouted to him, Stop! Don't kill yourself. We're all here. I just kind of go back. The Lord told me to stop for a second. Because it said that the presence showed up. The earth began to shake. And all the doors flew open. I just felt like God told me to tell somebody in here. There's some doors getting ready to fly open in your life. Some doors you've been believing for. Some doors that you think have been locked. Some doors that you think have been kept, kept you shut in. You've been trapped. You have nowhere to go. God's about to open those doors. They're not going to creep open. They're not going to just crack open. They're going to fly open in the name of Jesus. I feel God in this place. Verse 29, then the jailer called for the lights and he ran to the dungeon and he fell down before them trembling. And he said to Paul and Silas, he brought him out and he said, Sir, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved along with everyone in your household. And they shared the word of the Lord with him and with all who lived in his household. And even at that hour, the jailer cared for them and washed their wounds. Then he and everyone in their household were immediately baptized. He brought them into the house and he set a meal before him and he and his entire household rejoiced because they all believed in God. The next morning, the city officials sent the police to tell the jailer, let those men go. So the jailer told Paul, the city officials have said, you and Silas are free to leave, go in peace. But Paul replied, I like this. But Paul replied, they have publicly beaten us without a trial and they put us in prison and we are Roman citizens. So now they want us to leave secretly? Certainly not. Let them come themselves and release us. And when the police reported this to the city officials, they were alarmed to learn that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens. So they came to the jail and apologized to them. Then they brought them out and begged them to leave the city. Look, we may not be Roman citizens, but can I tell you what we 
are, we're kingdom citizens in this place. And I just feel God on this word right now. That the enemy's trying to put you away. And he tried to put you away in front of people publicly. And now he wants you to come out silently. But nah, he's going to come right here. The Bible says he's going to set up a table before us in the presence of our enemies. And what he tried to do to take you down publicly, he's going to put you on public display to bring you out in the name of Jesus. Nah, you ain't, you ain't putting us out secretly. Nah. The whole world's going to know. <laughs> when Paul and Silas left the prison, they returned to the home of Lydia. There they met with the believers and encouraged them one more. And encouraged them once more. And then they left town. Can we just worship some more? Y'all mind can we just worship some more? Come on. Lead us. Somebody was rubbing oil on you at some point during the service. Some of you came from the opposite. Some of you maybe came from more of a Baptist background or a Presbyterian background. And, and you get spanked at the end of the service by your mama if you made one sound in the service. You see somebody raise their hand, it makes you nervous. 
There are people in here who never grew up in church. You grew up. Never been in an environment like this. Some of you don't even know if you believe in God or church. There are people watching online, listening in this room. You don't even know if you like God. Matter of fact, you're mad at God and church for some things that you've gone through. we got all of those people in this room right now. we got so many different personality backgrounds. we got people that are loud and wild, kind of like me. And then you got people who are super introverted and super quiet and and you, you got people that will raise their hand and shout at every song that comes on. You got people that will never even raise their voice and don't want anybody to hear them sing. And, and because of the background and because of our personalities and because of everything that, that, that we've, we, we've grown up in, a lot of us don't really... Maybe we've never even been taught about worship. Maybe we don't understand what worship really is. But as I talk about the season that we're in, the jars that we're putting on the table, listen, y'all, I couldn't get through this season without putting this significant jar of worship on the table. Because what culture has convinced us of, what the world has convinced us of, is this, is that everything that we're going to do to succeed, everything we're going to do to solve a problem, everything we're going to do to make it through, is going to be because of our attention and our hard work. And don't get me wrong, there's a lot of attention and hard work that needs to be put into it. But can I tell you something? Everything we're involved in is spiritual. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And there is a spiritual side to things that if we don't get it, y'all, if we don't realize the spiritual side of things, we will miss out. We're missing the thing that really has the weight to push things forward. Come on, today I'm talking about winning with worship. Winning with worship. Come on, say winning with worship. Every day. We don't get this so good that all y'all going to be singing after this is all I do is win, win, win. No matter what. Come on, say winning, winning. with worship. With worship. But we got to understand it. I mean, what is, what is, what is worship? I was, I was thinking about that, and I, I got to thinking about relationships. And, and Have y'all ever heard of this, the, the, the thought of the love languages? That we speak love to each other. We show love to each other by speaking each other's love language. Because just me saying I love you does not mean anything. Words can be cheap, y'all. Y'all ever heard this? Actions speak louder than words. Well, when it comes to love, that's so true. Because you can say you love me all day long. Do you know how you show me you love me? You get to know me enough to learn my love language. And then you're, you speak to me by speaking my love language. All of us have different love languages. There, there's five of them. There, there's somebody, some love languages are, are, are gifts. Uh, words of affirmation. Quality time. Uh, acts of service. Um, physical touch. All of us are different. You know what? Some of us even have different times of our life where a language speaks to us differently. If your love language is, is, is acts of service, the greatest way that I can say I love you is to do something for you. It's that moment to where somebody does that chore for you. They scrub the floors. They do the dishes. They run that errand. They go do whatever. And that, more than anything in the world, says that person loves me. Some of it is gifts. If you just show up, I mean, with something small, you show up with a candy bar. You're like, oh my goodness, they thought about me. They love me. Some is just is, is that quality time. If you'll just sit there with me on the couch, it don't even have to be for a long time, but for 10 minutes, you'll snuggle my buns off. Whatever it is, 10 minutes you'll have. Look, put your phone down and look at me and have a conversation. 10 minutes. You'll go on this walk with me. Ten minutes, you'll do that. It's the quality time. That speaks a lot. Some of it's words of affirmation. If somebody just tells you, hey, you did a great job. That says to you, I love you. 
You, you know what doesn't say to someone you love them is when, when you don't speak their love language to them. And when I was talking about worship and thinking about worship, the way that I felt like I was supposed to draw a picture for you to understand is this. Is that worship is God's love language. It's His love language. It's that, it's that place to where He feels more than you just saying, hey, you're God and I love you. He feels that the energy you give in acknowledging how great He is shows Him that you really believe in Him on another yeah, level. Yeah, amen. We say worship, it can also be said, I, I've said it this way, worship. It's the way that we just say to Him, you're worth anything. And there's such a fight against worship. Right? There's such a fight against worship because worship is so important. Worship is what's going to win things. Amen. It's what's going to win things. I mean, can you not see? Can, can we draw the whole picture? Are you ready? We all talk about Satan. Do you know who Satan was before he was Satan? He was Lucifer. He was one of the most beautiful angels in heaven. And guess what his job was? Ready for this? He was the worship leader in heaven. All of the other angels brought him their worship. And then he took their worship to the throne room of God and gave it to God. He knows the power of worship. He knows what worship can do. He knows that worship is like throwing gasoline on the fire at God's throne room. He knows that when he showed up with all the worship from those angels, what it did in the throne room of God. Which is why his fight is to keep you from worshiping. It's why He wants to keep you distracted. It's why He wants to keep that mess going on in your life. Because you'll get so messed up in the mess that you won't even give a second thought to worshiping God. You'll be so worried about what you've got to do just to get through today that you won't even give a thought about what could really not just get you through today but could get you through the rest of your life. He's at war against that. It's important. Can, can I preach to you a little bit? Can I be your pastor? Let's step on that. Can, I, can I step on some toes? Yeah. I'm going to step on my own. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to equally step on toes today. But that's what I want to challenge all of y'all who show up at the third song every week. Because maybe this music's too loud or it ain't your style or whatever it is, but you just come to hear my preaching. Can I just tell you something? You don't win the war with preaching. You win with worship. My preaching is going to give you information. My preaching is going to challenge you. My preaching is going to get you to the point where you will say, I will consider making that move because that makes sense. It can make my life better. But you won't even get to the point of considering it unless your heart is softened to a place for you to receive the Word of God. That is a seed that it getting in your head is not going to change anything. It has to get in your heart in order to spring forth because out of the heart spring the issues of life. And I'm telling you, what will get you to that place is when you show up and get lathered in worship. Y'all, can I just challenge our church right now? I just want to put us on a challenge from now on. I want people to be waiting at the doors every week to get in for the first song. Because they can't wait to get lathered up in worship. To get all the junk rinsed off from the week. So their heart can be positioned in such a place that the seed of the Word of God can be planted deep on the inside of us. So that we can not come to church as a religious activity. But we can walk out of here every week changed. Having one stone built upon another in our life. Getting made into great men and women of God. Amen. We're going to win. How? With worship. worship. Come on, say winning. Winning. With worship. With worship. Winning. Winning. With worship. With worship. I, I was, as I read through this text, and I, we go through the story. It's a, it's a perfect, it's a, it's a perfect blueprint of what I think God wanted to use to show us the importance of worship in our life. What it can really do to us that can take us to the next level. I'd love to talk that through with you. Can, you, can we talk about that today? I want to I 
I want to let you know some things that worship will do that can change everything. First thing we got to realize if we're going to win with worship. First thing we got to realize is this, ready? Worship changes your perspective. Amen. Worship changes your perspective. Look, 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 let's just read this real quick. Verse 22. A mob formed against Paul and Silas, and the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wood rods. They were beaten severely and thrown into prison. And the jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape. So he put them into the inner dungeon and he clamped their feet with stocks and with chains. But it was at midnight that Paul and Silas began praying and singing songs and hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening. I, I, I think we need to kind of get what's going on here. Because, can I be real? I think sometimes we read the Bible and think it's cute. Oh, that's Paul and Silas. They praise the Lord. That's good. Yeah, praise. You got to realize, y'all, they were men. They, they were people just like us. They were just like us. They had feelings, like emotional. They had physical feelings. They, they literally were stripped naked in front of the whole town. That's humiliating. I don't care who you are. They were beaten with wooden rods. That hurts when you're a human being. And they were drugged for no reason to the inner part the dungeon and put in chains with guards around them so they could not go out. I think we need to understand what happened here. Listen, they stripped them and they beat them. They're naked, getting beat with wooden rods so hard that it would not just make lumps on them, it would split their skin open and make wounds on them. We read later on that the jailer began to wash their wounds when he came into their house. They had wounds. So I want you to see what's going on. They get beaten. They've got wounds all over them. And now they drag them into the inner part of the jail. We don't know how to think about that because we're like, oh, yeah, they went to jail. So they're like, you know, they're outside playing ball a couple hours a day. They got a weight room. Like they may be playing some cards with the other prisoners. And, and then they got some hot meals and a shower and somewhere to lay down. No! That was not jail back then. Just jail. They were in the inner part of the jail, which was the dungeon, which was dark, damp, and dirty. If you put open wounds in dark, damp, and dirty, do you know what you get? You get death in that time period. Because you get infection. And you get infection that travels to the body. And then they become septic. And then they get fever. And then they die. So listen, what you got to understand is Paul and Silas were basically given a death sentence. For doing nothing but preaching the gospel of Jesus. Here they are. Chained up. Together. Can't go nowhere. In the dark. In the dungeon. All the bugs and worms and dirt. All in their wounds. They can probably know. They know that this is the death sentence. Nobody knows where they're at. Talks about Lydia and all the other people there at their house. They don't know where they're at. They drug them in the dungeon. They can't come get them. They can't get out their cell. They're stuck and they're going to die. They have every reason on the planet to have an attitude. Because that's what happens when we live life with natural perspective. Come on. Natural perspective will point out to you everything that can and will and might and could happen that's negative. It'll put you in anxiety. It'll put you in worry. It'll put you in a bad mood. It'll make you sad. I'm glad mad is what I meant to say. It'll make you, it'll put you in a place that is a bad place to be in because it will convince you that it's over. Natural perspective always leans toward the negative. Always leans toward the negative. And here they are with the opportunity to be sitting in there. I mean, listen, they could have just been sitting in there and Paul could have been like, this is ridiculous, Silas. Forget this, man. We're doing stuff to God and He allows this to happen. We out here preaching the gospel and now we're beaten, going to die down here in this deep, dark dungeon. We could have done some better things with our life. Who are these people beating us? Who do they think they are? Get us out of these chains. We'll show them what's up. 
Give me that wood rod. I wish they'd come in here right now. Guard, where are you at? Where's the manager? I got some things to say. Nah. You know what happened? Verse 22. They had something on the inside of them that knew the only way to win was with worship. They had something in them that knew nothing in the natural could get them out of what they got into. But there was something in the spiritual that could move things and move it fast. So you know what they start doing? It's midnight. Midnight when most people are sleeping. Midnight. Midnight when most people are giving up on the day. It's midnight. It's midnight when everybody's like, oh, we can't do nothing about it. It's midnight. Midnight when everybody else can lay down and quit and leave it up to whatever happens. Midnight. Midnight when it's the darkest part of the day. Doesn't seem like light's coming. Nervousness happens at midnight. Nightmares happens at midnight. Scared. You're scared at midnight. It's midnight. And what do they start doing? The Bible says, verse 22, they start praying and singing songs. Praying and singing songs. Praying and singing songs. Praying and singing. They are, they are in there, wounded, in the dirt, chained up, nowhere to go, un, not even justly put in there. Everybody around them, and they take that time to worship God. Come on. Hey. I could be sleeping, but I'm going to be worshiping. I could be complaining, but I'm going to be worshiping. I could be trying to escape, but I'm going to be worshiping. Because I know right now my energy's got to go to the right thing. So they start singing and they start worshiping. And did you see what the Bible says? The Bible says when they start singing and they start worshiping, everybody started listening. The atmosphere started shifting. The atmosphere started changing. Everybody was chained up. Everybody was laying down. Everybody was asleep. Everybody didn't want to get... I feel God in this place. There's some people under the sound of my voice. You've been chained up and asleep on the inside. Your purpose has been in a prison somewhere. But I just came to say that through your worship, God's going to break some things free in you. Some things are going to begin to rise up. And it's going to take get the attention of some people around you. I'm preaching in this place. The whole atmosphere begins to shift. Everything begins to change. Everything begins to change. They start worshiping and everything begins to change. Everything begins to change. They start worshiping and everything begins to change. Can I say it again? They start worshiping and everything began to change. But don't get excited yet because here's what I saw. Here's what I saw. Ready? Everything began to change. Accept their situation. <laughs> Everybody was sleeping. It was dark. It was midnight. They were chained up. There was no hope. Death was in the air until they started worshiping. And when they started worshiping, death couldn't hold the same space as worship. When they started worshiping, fear couldn't hold the same space as worship. When they started worshiping, anxiety couldn't hold the same space as worship. When they started worshiping, change couldn't hold the same space as worship. When they started worshiping, the, everything holding everybody else couldn't even stay in the room. They popped up, started listening, thinking, oh, I feel some change, even though it don't look like nothing's changing. Oh, I still see my change, but something's changing. Oh, I still see the dirt, but something's changing. Oh, it's still dark in here, but something's changing. I can't see who's singing, but I'm going to sing with them because I felt something change when they raised their voice. Their situation's the same, but everything's changed. Hmm. Here's what worship will do. It'll shift your perspective. Because we're, we're, can, can, can I just be honest? It's me too. We are waiting on the end result. Before we let our worship out. That's right. Get it true. We're waiting for God to do what we expect Him to do before we think He deserves us telling Him He's worthy of what we want Him to do. So if He breaks these chains, I'm going to worship. No, God didn't come and say, Paul, Silas, I'm going to break the chains. I'm going to open doors. I'm going to get you out of here if you worship. No, they just thought, even if we die, in this dark dungeon. We're not going to die complaining. We're not going to die being mad. We're not going to die being 
being bitter. We're not going to die being remorseful and regretful. We're going to die with worship on our lips. They made the decision that if nothing changes around me, everything's going to change in me. It, 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 it's, it's the saying, I don't know if you've ever heard it, that, that all the water in the world can't sink a ship unless it gets on the inside of it. That's right. And what they decided was none of this is going to be in the inside of me. I'm going to worship. And when I worship, my perspective is going to change. Perspective is so interesting. Perspective is amazing. Perspective can change everything if you change it. I was reminded about that because, I, I, you know, today's my birthday and I'm going to be, you know, 30 today. And uh, I'm excited about that. Um, excited about my 30s. Um, but I was, uh, I was, I was thinking about that because I, I started thinking about my dad. My dad passed away two years ago. You know, he was a big part of helping the church. He was, he was one of those guys that you, if you wanted to have a good time, you wanted him around. He was going to laugh. He was going to cut up. He was going to have a good time. I thought about it because my dad loved birthdays. Birthdays were my dad's thing. He loved birthdays. Big deal birthday, big deal birthday. He loved birthdays. They were a big deal to him. He always wanted to do something big for me on my birthday. I remember this one year. <clears throat> see how spiritual you are. See how many people, how many saved people we got in the room. I, just to let you know, are y'all with me? He knew this. I'm a Michael Jordan fan. We got anybody in the room? Oh, wow. We got to work on y'all. Help them, Lord. Uh, it doesn't matter. It's, you, you're a fan of the generation of who you grow up with. I grew up with him, and I was a fan of him. And, and they, they had this restaurant in Chicago called the Michael Jordan Restaurant. And, and, and my mom had gotten me this book, Come Fly With Me. It was Michael Jordan. It has a big old handprint in it. I don't know if y'all remember that. And it had all these pictures. And it showed his restaurant. And I got that book when I was like, I don't know, I was like 17 when I got that book. And I always wanted to go, since I was 17, to the Michael Jordan Restaurant. And my dad said, here's what I'm going to do. For your birthday, I'm going to fly you up. Let's go to Chicago. We'll go for a couple days. We'll shop on Michigan Avenue and all the shopping. And then we'll, we'll go to the Michael Jordan restaurant. I was like, yeah, it's like the greatest thing. I was, you know me, I'm still, I was like, maybe Michael Jordan will be there. <laughs> My dad was always fun to travel with. I can tell you some really funny stories. Remind me to tell you about his medicine and his computer. I'll tell you that one day. But we, we, we missed our flight. In, in Charlotte, ended up having to stay an extra night in Charlotte, so we missed the whole day in Chicago. And we get there, and so we got like 18 hours that we got to do our whole plan. Okay? And I remember thinking, I grew up in Powdersville, y'all. I know you've never heard of it. <laughs> Powdersville, South Carolina. Okay? I say Greenville because it's the next biggest city, and it's not even big. I grew up in Powdersville. I, mean, I traveled some, but I didn't get around a lot. So Chicago, that's huge to me. I've never been to a huge city like that before. I was thinking, God, this thing is huge. I bet Chicago's huge. I was so excited to come. And I remember we started coming in in the flight. And I raised my blind up and I looked over. And I saw a man's beautiful sitting right there on the lake. And I looked at it. It's so beautiful. But I had this thought in my mind. God, that's small, man. When we landed, we got on the like subway, train thing, whatever that's called, something different in every city. We rode it all the way to the city. Yeah. Can I tell you something? When I got in the city, it ain't little. <laughs> those buildings are huge. You can walk all day long and not get around all those streets. I mean, they got the one building, one of the tallest buildings in the world. You stand there, you look up all the way to the top, you can barely even see the top. I mean, they, the buildings are huge. Just all the, I mean, the Nike stores, four stories high. So crazy that something, when I stood in the middle of it, was overwhelming, seemed tiny to me when my perspective changed. Come on, come on, dude. When I was in it, it was huge. When I was above it, it seemed little. Wow. Wow. That's, good. That's what worship does. 
I think we want to worship to change the situation when God wants to, us to worship to change us. Mm. That's it. What He's doing in worship, sometimes things change. But sometimes our perspective shifts. Come on. And worship will shift your perspective. It changes everything. I, can you think about it? Listen, here you got Paul and Silas stuck in the middle of all these prisoners. Could have done anything they want and at midnight start praising and worshiping God because their perspective shifted. You know, can you imagine talking? Hey, Paul, what are you going to do? Hey, listen. When we're out there and we sing and worship, everybody runs off. When we're out there and we preach, nobody listens. They run. When we worship out there, nobody sticks around. They go home. I got an idea. Let's worship. We got a captive audience. <laughs> they can't go nowhere. <laughs> You're exhausted from dragging them. It's two in the afternoon. You feel like you can go to bed for the night. And it's the exhaustion of dragging those chains. I'm with you. God wants to set us free. There are things that will get free in a moment. There are things that will get free over time as we continue. There are things that will get free through natural things that God's given us. There, It will all collectively happen. But God is calling us to a place today to say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make a staple of my life worship. That's what happens. Because let's be real. Y'all smiling at me and you all dressed up and you're doing your thing right now. But I'm no dummy. I know you're struggling. I know you didn't come all the way happy today. And if you did today, you had a good week, but you didn't last week. It's okay. We all got stuff we're dealing with. There's no expectation to come here better, good, fixed, healed. No, the expectation here is come as you are. But do you know what you know the importance of being together? Is that when I feel chained and I don't even have the strength to worship, the overflow out of you is taking the chains off of me. It's when I show up for the first song and I don't even feel like opening my mouth, but by the third song, I want to run a lap. And nothing changed other than the people around me and their worship started filling the room. Listen, y'all. You never know every week who may be sitting beside you who just needs to hear you worship. Yes, yes. As much as you need it, they need it too. Sometimes you sing those songs out and those songs move you. Sometimes you don't even have words to say in your worship. Sometimes your worship is just you and God telling Him how amazing He is. You're not going to have a live band with you every day. You're not going to have me on the microphone with you every day. But you know what you got? You got God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost right there with you. And you know what can be just as strong as worship right here? Come on. We got to know what's just as strong as worship right here because guess what? The church ain't the building. Are y'all with me? The shower can become the church in the morning when you, and you may sing as bad as I do. And I don't know if there's anybody can sing that bad. But God don't care. 
don't care if it sounds good. He don't care if it's on tune. He don't care if it's on pitch. He don't care if it's any of that. He just cares that your heart came to worship. You can be standing in that shower alone with nobody around, just worshiping God at the top of your lung. You can be driving your car. You can be eating your breakfast. You can be putting your makeup on. You can be brushing your teeth. Worshiping God just like that. It can come out vocal. It can be in your head. It can be right. Whatever it is, just to worship Him. It don't have to be a song. When I worship Him, I just tell Him, I just say, God, you're so holy. God, you're so mighty. God, you're worthy and you're so strong and you're so good. God, you're so kind and you're so gentle and you're so patient and you're so loving and you're so forgiving and you're so long-suffering. Magnificent. God, you're big. You're grand. You're great. You're above all. You're bigger than all. You're set apart. You're different. You're nothing like anything else. There's no one like you. You're so big, God, that you breathe. You just breathe. And all the stars and all the galaxies and all the universes came out. Trillions upon trillions of stars came out of your breath. God, you're so big that you spoke. And everything I see when I walk out of the door, the beautiful green trees, the amazing blue sky, the sun that shines, the refreshing rain, everything that just takes my breath away, the blue seas in the Caribbean and the mountains that I see out west, anything that I can see across the world, the seven wonders of the world, you spoke and brought those into creation. You just kneel down and put your hand in some dirt and breathe, and that's why I exist. You're a big God. Trillions on trillions on quadrillions of gallons of water in the ocean, and you tell it it can only come so far. You're so powerful. You're so great, but you're so good. That even though you can take care of all of the big stuff, you care about every detail of my life. so loving that even when I mess up all the time, you're right there with a smile and a hug saying, let's go. I still got more. You're worthy. You're worth it all. You're worth my life. You're worth my time. You're worth my effort. You're worth whatever I got to go through. what I like to say. I don't know what you would say. You've got the life that you're living. You've got the things you're going through. You've got the way that you can connect. But you know what worship is? Worship is when you take that time in the day and you just let Him know how amazing He is. You just let Him know that no matter what's going on, God, I know you're bigger than it all. felt like we were supposed to have an opportunity right now online. I just felt like we're supposed to have an opportunity wherever we are. Can we just stand on our feet? I just felt like we're supposed to have an opportunity to worship. Come on, just leave your phones in your seat. Just, just, I, I, didn't, I don't think we need to have an opportunity to sing. Maybe you sing. I don't know. Maybe you know the words. Maybe you don't. I don't know. But here's what we need to do. We need to have an opportunity to worship. This is you. You tell God whatever you want. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to be vocal. I want you to be loud. Maybe you want to pray in your prayer language. Maybe you just want to tell Him how good He is. Maybe you just want to clap. Maybe you just want to yell. Maybe you just want to cry. Maybe you want to run a lap around the building. It doesn't matter what you want to do. But in this moment, just let worship come out. Just let worship come out. Just let worship come out. Come on, whatever you do, just let worship come out. Father, we just come to worship You right now. Come on, just let worship come out. We let worship come out, Father.